first at 9. This is Other Than A 24-7. Making headlines tonight, a Sri Lankan stranded in a possible hijack of an oil tanker off Somalian shores. Sri Lankan government and European Union agrees on full implementation of Geneva resolutions as a priority. Joint opposition urges government not to co-sponsor UNHCR resolutions. And in the international headlines, British Parliament passes the long-debated Brexit bill. Good evening, Mahesh Johnny with Other Than 24-7. We are live this summer across the nation. As always, here's a first look at the local stories. Sri Lanka and the European Union have agreed that full implementation of the October 2015 UN Human Rights Council resolution remains a priority. This was discussed when an EU delegation led by EU External Action Service Deputy Managing Director for Asia and the Pacific, Paola Pampaloni, called on Prime Minister Rani Wickremesinghe and met with Foreign Affairs Minister Mangala Samaravira. The EU says it recognizes the progress made by the government in various areas and that both sides recognizes the need for further progress on reconciliation. The EU delegation arrived in Sri Lanka for the second meeting of the Working Group on Governance, Rule of Law and Human Rights, which concluded today. In a joint statement, Sri Lanka and the EU reaffirmed their commitment to collaborate on effective implementation of international human rights instruments. The EU has also reiterated its readiness to continue support, supporting the Sri Lankan government for reforms, including with financial assistance. And also, the parties have discussed Sri Lanka's application for EU's GSP Plus facility, which is currently under consideration by the European Parliament and the Council. Therefore, the EU has drawn attention to the importance of Sri Lanka making prompt and concrete progress in fulfilling international commitments on human rights. The newly constructed seven-story building at the Demetakuda Makutorama Myanmar Temple was declared open by President Maithripala Sirisena today. The building was constructed with donations from citizens of Myanmar. Minister of Megapolis and Western Development, Patali Champika Ranavaka, along with the Ambassador of Myanmar, His Excellency Yu Min Thein Zan, joined President Sirisena during the ceremony. Buddhist monks from both Sri Lanka and Myanmar also took part in the opening ceremony. The president gifted tokens of appreciation in gratitude for their donations. Several organizations and political parties expressed their views regarding the attack launched by police yesterday on university students protesting against the Saitam Private Medical College. Protesting university students toppled barricade attempting to enter the presidential secretariat premises disregarding a court order. Saitam should be abolished. Students who are currently studying in that university should be provided with a reasonable solution. If possible, the facilities that were constructed for Saitam should be converted into a medical faculty for universities like Moratua. The reason that police do not act against Saitam is because they are accepting money from them. Or maybe the judicial system is accepting their money. Otherwise, there is an invisible political hand behind this. The government is aggravating the Saitam issue. The reason for the government delaying the decision is because they are concealing the real issues of the country, including the constitution and privatization, behind SITEM. As a government medical organization of doctors, we deplored the attack against medical students yesterday. Hasn't this president been elected by votes of the people? If so, can't students go before the presidential secretariat in order to voice our protest? Former superintendent of public debt department R.D. Nanakara says he would have informed his superiors if he had known the relationship between former central bank governor Arjuna Mahindran and former director of perpetual treasuries Arjun Alosius. Testifying before the Commission of Inquiry on Bond Issuance today, Nana Kara said he would have paid attention to the potential conflict of interest. In the meantime, former Central Bank Governor Arjuna Mahendran visited the Commission for a third day to record a statement with the CID office at the premises. 
The Commission gathered for the 11th day of sitting today and former superintendent of the Central Bank's Public Debt Department, R.D. Nanakara, testified for a second day. Responding to questions raised by state councils, the former PDD superintendent stated that he was not aware of the relationship between former CBSL Governor Arjuna Mahendran and former Director of Perpetual Treasuries Arjun Aloysius at the time Perpetual Treasuries applied for a license to be a primary dealer. Had he known the relationship, he stated that he would have discussed the matter with his superiors in order to take a decision given the possibility of a conflict of interest. State councils, quoting a statement made by Arjun Aloysius to the first COPE inquiry on the controversial bond issue, highlighted that Aloysius resigned as director at Perpetual Treasuries following information that his father-in-law, Arjuna Mahendran, was to be appointed the governor of Central Bank. Quoting the COPE report further, state councils emphasized that former State Minister Rosie Senanayaka had questioned former Central Bank Governor Ajit Nivad Cabral whether Shiromi Wickramasinghe, who was a board member of Perpetual Capital Holdings at the time, was his sister. As per the state councils, Cabral had not responded directly to the question and said that Perpetual Capital Holdings is not a primary dealer. Attorneys representing Perpetual Treasuries, meanwhile, informed the Commission of Inquiry that they will make a clarification regarding the matter soon. State councils went on to question the license of Perpetual Treasuries. Supreme Court Justice Prasanna Jawadna emphasized that since primary dealers are supposed to show assets of 300 million rupees, Perpetual Treasuries had deposited the amount in a current account. Justice Prasanna Jawadna asked Nane Akara why they had granted Perpetual Treasuries a license as current accounts lack consistency. The former superintendent of PDD responded that it was taken at face value since it had the certification of auditors. The Commission will continue with its inquiries tomorrow. Sri Lanka Navy confirmed that there are eight Sri Lankans in the commercial ship which is allegedly hijacked by the Somali pirates. Commenting on the incident to other Derana, the European Union Naval Force Spokesperson Commander Jacqueline Sheriff said that investigations are being carried out as to whether the ship is being hijacked or faced some other challenges. Quoting the piracy expert John Steed, Reuters today reported that Somali pirates were suspected of hijacking the Sri Lankan-flagged fuel freighter Aris-13. Reuters further reported the vessel had sent a distress call, turned off its tracking system and altered course for the Somali coast. The reports also mentioned that the vessel made a sharp turn just after it passed the Horn of Africa on its voyage from Dubai to Mogadishu. The 1,800 deadweight ton Aris-13 is owned by Panama Company Army Shipping and managed by Aurora Ship Management in the United Arab Emirates. If confirmed, this incident would be the first hijack of a commercial ship by Somali pirates since 2012. Meanwhile, issuing a statement regarding the alleged hijacking, the ministry is taking action to verify the alleged incident and initial inquiries have revealed that while the vessel involved is not registered under a Sri Lankan flag, it has a eight-member Sri Lankan crew. The statement further mentions that the ministry continues to remain in touch with the shipping agents, concerned authorities as well as relevant Sri Lankan missions overseas to ascertain further information on the matter in order to ensure the safety of the Sri Lankan nationals. However, citing a Somali official, updated news reports from Reuters later in the day confirmed that the incident is a pirate hijacking of oil tanker Aris-13 with eight Sri Lankan crew on board. Meanwhile, we contacted Sri Lankan Navy for an update. The Sri Lankan Navy was informed uh, early this morning by MRC uh, France, which is the Maritime Rescue Coordinating Center France, merchant vessel Aries 13, uh, presumed to be uh, flying the flag of Sri Lanka, had been uh, hijacked or hi had been subjected to a piracy acts by a third party. When we further inquiry into the incident, we found out that the uh, ship uh, was registered at the state of Comoros. When we inquired into ship ma management company, which is Aurora Ship Management, uh, they stated that eight of the crew members were Sri Lankans. They, that has a, that is a serious uh, situation. So we informed the relevant authorities and stakeholders, especially the com combined maritime force, which is uh, the key stakeholder, key naval body or the maritime body which is operating in these waters specifically with regard to the maritime uh, anti-piracy operations. 
So we have informed the relevant authorities at the international organizations, especially to ensure the safety, uh, safety uh, of uh, the Sri Lankan citizens who are said to be on board on this merchant vessel Ares 13. Whether we have yet to clarify whether it's a car and the Piracy Act or an armed robbery or a certain maritime hijacking situation or whether it's an experience of some other incident. The European Union Naval Force is also carrying out investigations into the incident. We understand that uh, a ship that was sailing close to the Somali coast sent out a distress signal say it was being approached by, uh, by boats um, from the stern. The maritime patrol aircraft for the EU Naval Force was launched and we are currently overflying the vessel to investigate what has actually happened. Unfortunately, there are no communications with the ship at this time. I understand there was up to eight crew members on board the, the vessel at the time of the incident, but the EU Naval Force is working very hard to try and uh, ascertain the facts. Of course, our thoughts are with the crew on board the ship at this time, and I'm sure their families will be very worried. Once we become aware of the incident, what we've been doing is working with our counter-piracy partners who also operate in the area. One of our partners, the Combined Maritime Force, actually has a warship uh, to the north of the, the vessel, and they are currently... Um, traveling south to investigate. Importantly as well, it's worth saying we're also working with our Somali partners as well off the Somali coast to see whether they can help uh, investigate what has actually happened. And I know they're working hard to try and ascertain the, um, the incident and the, the background to it. And as soon as we know, that we will be issuing a statement. Piracy experts had this to say regarding the incident. This is an unsafe zone. When voyaging in these seas, we should do so under the supervision of representative authorities. We should look into the weather. These pirates are from Mogadishu. This is such an unfortunate incident. It is being reported that Janaka Chaminda, a resident of Devinuara in Mathura, was among the crew members of this vessel. Speaking to other Derana, his wife stated that her husband had contacted her last on the 9th of this month. In other local stories, the Joint Opposition's Economic Research Unit said that the president should not accommodate the UNHCR resolution co-sponsored by the Sri Lankan government. These views were expressed at a media briefing in Colombo today. Sri Lankan government stated before the Human Rights Council that it was not necessary to amend the 2015 resolution. President Maitripala Sirisena repeatedly states that he is not willing to accommodate foreign judges in Sri Lanka. Since of late, Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe appears to have the same opinion. As such, how could the government say that they plan to implement the resolution? Therefore, I request the President not to support this resolution. The Pathfinder organization has suggested that if we are to free ourselves from the financial crisis, that we should privatize 18 companies that have a total value of 5.8 billion US dollars. The government plans to acquire this amount by selling these assets. Hilton Hotel for 250 million dollars, Water's Edge for 100 million dollars, Grand Oriental Hotel, Litro Gas, Lanka Hospitals, Lak Danavi, Hambantar Airport and Petroleum Retail Distributions. Due to the decrease in oil prices during the last two years, we have saved $4 billion in foreign exchange. If we utilize our resources effectively, we will not have to sell any of these assets. The Northern Provincial Council has approved a proposal that the Northern and the Eastern provinces should be joined and the government should let them take independent decisions on behalf of the people. According to the other Derana reporter, they have seconded this proposal during a special debate regarding the matter. Some of the opposition members, particularly Mr. Senivaradna and Dharmapala, they have requested me to oppose this resolution on the basis that it's not only requesting the uh, UNHCR to request the government of Sri Lanka to implement the resolution fully. It is going beyond the resolution, asking a lot of other things. So they really wanted to oppose this resolution, so, and they have really opposed this resolution. And because I am the leader of the opposition, and they have insisted me also to oppose this uh, resolution, so I have refrained from any supporting or opposing it, and I had to give due respect to the request of my members. So on that basis, I have refrained from supporting it.
Welcome back, everyone. Government specialist doctors have requested the government to relax provisions pertaining to the law on abortions. Convening a media briefing today, they stated that attention of the cabinet has been drawn in this regard. Abortion is generally illegal in Sri Lanka under the Penal Code of 1883 and will subject up to three years imprisonment and fines unless the miscarriages was caused in good faith in order to save the mother's life. We are requesting to provide authorization under the circumstances such as rape, sexual abuse of girls and in the case of genetic defects in the embryo. A cabinet paper will be submitted to legalize abortion in the case of these three instances. There are 6,000 to 6,500 children born with birth defects and 500 to 600 infants die during their first year. We have 80% ability to diagnose birth defects during the pregnancy period. Forensic doctors, obstetricians and gynecologists, pediatricians and community doctors appeal to give a chance to these needy women. In other local stories, in an insight upon the long-standing conflict between Palestine and Israel, former Anglican Bishop of Colombo, Right Reverend Dulip D. Chikera, stated that the two war-torn territories are indeed compatible with each other, but prompted action was needed. He said this speaking at the inauguration ceremony of Sri Lankan Journalists for Global Justice held yesterday at the Lakshman Kadragama Institute of International Relation and Strategic Studies. So I come to you in peace and for peace. And rather than wave a white flag, I decided that I would wear one. Today I long for a solution and I do not see the possibility of a solution till the Palestinians receive equal rights and justice as an independent and free nation. When I say this, I am mindful that such a thrust will not and does not undermine justice for the people of Israel. And so we need to construct a fresh and a fair and a speedy plan of action if Palestinian Arabs are to receive their political, social and economic rights. To move towards the two-state solution, Israel has to return to its boundaries of 1969 and to withdraw all post-1969 settlements. Jerusalem should be accessible to all three religions. But for a while, it may be necessary for Jerusalem to come under UN supervision. And there must be the protection of rights for all Palestinian Arabs living in Israel and for all Israelis living in Palestine and for all Christians living in both states. On to business news now, the Colombo stock market slipped for a sixth straight session despite foreign inflows. Foreign investors were on the buying side for the 10th consecutive day with net foreign inflow of 113 million rupees. Foreign participation for the day was at 60% of total turnover. For more details, here is RM Sivanandan from the Colombo Stock Exchange. The benchmark all share price index lost 24.01 points to close at 6,046.79, while the Centre Sri Lanka 20 index lost 22.19 points to close at 3,459.89. The turnover was 888.2 million rupees with 22.53 million shares changing hands in 2,898 trades. Top 5 gainers of the day were Ism Leasing Non Voting, Kotmali Holdings, Alufab, Colombo Land, and Lotus Hydro Power. Today, there were 11 crossings and the crossing turnover was 415.09 million rupees. The Sri Lankan rupee ended steady today. Rupee forwards were active with two week forwards ending at 152 rupees to 50 to 75 cents per dollar. Little change from yesterday's close. Here's a look at how the Sri Lankan rupee traded against other currencies during the day today.
On sports tonight, Sri Lanka and Bangladesh face off tomorrow in Colombo for a second test that has extra significance for the visitors. The match is uh, Bangladesh's 100th since they attained test status in 2000, but they will go into it needing a win to save the two-match series. Bit of bounce, good catch, glove. Sri Lanka defeated Bangladesh by 259 runs in the first test in Gaul, with Rangana Herat becoming the leading wicket-taker among left-arm spinners in tests. Sri Lankan spinner Herat spoke at a media briefing today. There it is, he breaks the record. So this is the new game. We have to uh, start from the zero. I'm so happy the uh, guys played because everybody contributed and the confidence level is high. I'm sure the guys will come back uh, with the same mindset for the second test as well. We are planning to have another good uh, winning mindset and have a good uh, test match in uh, this one as well. With a record to date of eight wins in 99 tests, Bangladesh will be playing their centenary match tomorrow without the services of Mahmudullah, who has been dropped. While the P. Sarvanamuttu Oval has not seen a drawn test since 2003, pre-monsoon thunderstorms may threaten play, especially post-lunch sessions. In international sports, Chelsea beat Manchester United for the second time this season as the two sides fought for a berth in the semi-finals of the English FA Cup. Chelsea took full advantage of United midfielder Andre Herrera sending off with a single goal deciding what was to be a volatile tie. Former Chelsea manager Jose Mourinho received a warm welcome before the encounter with the Stamford Bridge crowd in excellent voice. A second yellow in the first half for Ander Herrera reduced the United side to 10 men and triggered a heated confrontation between the two managers. Capitalizing on the one-man advantage, Chelsea midfielder N'Golo Kante fired in from range to give the home side what would be a decisive lead. The win sees Chelsea remain on course for a potential domestic double, with Tottenham Hotspur their next opponents in the FA Cup. While well, England won gold at the HSBC World Rugby Sevens Tournament in Vancouver after beating South Africa convincingly, this was England's second victory in the World Sevens Series, moving them up to second in the standings. Taking on first place, South Africa, who have won four out of six events so far this season, England went down to a first-minute try but equalised quickly with a 7-7 score holding until half-time. Half, Dan Bibby, Tom Mitchell and Dan Norton were able to add 12 points in a dominant second half with the Red and Whites keeping the South African scholars to triumph 19-7. Dan Norton was adjudged player of the match with his second half try, bringing his all-time try tally of 244 in the World Series to join highest with Collins in Jera. South Africa still lead, but that margin is closing now. England overtake Fiji into second place. On to international news now, the British Parliament passed the long-debated Brexit bill yesterday, allowing Prime Minister Theresa May to take further steps on the withdrawal of Britain from the European Union bloc. The bill will be now sent to Queen Elizabeth II, allowing the Premier to invoke Article 50 of the Lisbon Treaty, triggering formal discussions on leaving the EU. The House of Commons had voted earlier yesterday to roll back amendments made to the bill by the House of Lords, that called for a guarantee of the rights of EU nationals living in the UK. The Lords subsequently changed their stance and voted to pass the unamended bill. They have voted contents 118, not contents 274. So the not contents have it. Yeah, yeah. Premier Theresa May could invoke Article 50 as early as today, but is expected to wait until the end of this month to officially notify the EU of the withdrawal, which is expected to take about two years to reach completion. Brexit campaigners welcomed the mandate, but Jeremy Corbyn, the leader of Britain's Labour Party, said that the opposition would continue to press for the rights of EU nationals in the UK to receive priority. 
As blizzards roll in, life in the northern eastern states in America grinds to a halt with residents being advised to stay home and schools being cancelled. Airlines have cancelled more than 5,800 flights with Newark, LaGuardia and Boston Logan all severely affected. Some 50 million people in New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania and Connecticut are under blizzard and winter storm warnings with forecasts of two feet of snow and temperatures 15 to 30 degrees below normal for this time of year. New York City Public Schools, the largest school system in the U.S., cancelled classes today and federal agencies said that they would open three hours later than normal. The Port Authority of New York and New Jersey prepared hundreds of snow-clearing vehicles at the three major New York area airports, while thousands of tons of salt and sand were prepared for airport roads. American Airlines cancelled all flights into New York's three airports and JetBlue Airways also reported extensive cancellations. Delta Airlines cancelled 800 flights today for several northeast airports, while United Airlines said it would have no operations at Newark or LaGuardia. Also in international news, Malaysia announced today that North Korean migrant workers overstaying their visas will be deported to their home country. Deputy Prime Minister of Malaysia Ahmed Zaid Hamid said this speaking to a media in Kuala Lumpur. At least 50 North Korean workers who had overstayed their visas are currently detained in the state of Sarawak on Borneo Island and will be deported to Pyongyang. Deputy Prime Minister Ahmad Zaid Hamidi revealed yesterday that talks were underway to secure the release of nine Malaysians stranded in North Korea after Malaysians were banned from leaving. Malaysia and North Korea have seen diplomatic ties sour since investigations began into the murder of Kim Jong-nam, the estranged half-brother of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. Onto the weather now, prevailing rainy conditions is expected to gradually reduce within the next few days. However, showers or thunder showers will occur at several places over most provinces of the island late afternoon. A few showers are also likely along the eastern and southern coastal areas during the morning hours as well. Temperature across the island will gradually rise during the afternoon hours and then will reduce to a comfortable 29 degrees by early evening. Well, that is Other Than Inner News right here on Other Than Inner 24-7. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm Mahesh Shani. Good night.